the red country and part of the gray country of Oklahoma, the last rains came gently, and they did not cut the scarred earth. So begins Steinbeck's novel, The Grapes of Wrath. The events it describes happened 80 years ago. But today, once again, America is in the grip of unemployment and Oklahoma in the grip of drought. And I'm about to retrace the journey Steinbeck describes. No tag, 52. No tag. No tag. At the cattle market in El Reno, business is brisk, but for the wrong reasons. Farmers are bringing their cows to market because the drought, worse than any for 60 years, leaves them with no option. To operate my operation, I need four or five hundred thousand dollars. A year? Yep, to keep it flowing. Credit? Credit. Brett Porter farms 3,000 hectares, but cotton, wheat or beef, it's all failing. I've got a it's been bad. It's, uh, I've had to sell my calves earlier than what I normally do. Uh, last week, I sold half my mama cows. Does it ever make you feel like giving up? There's been a lot of nights that I don't get no sleep. Really? Because I stay up worried about how am I going to stretch this out? How am I going to make this work? But I believe, I believe in the Lord, and he'll get us through it. 51-2, At the cattle market, prices are falling, but unlike in the 1930s, the whole farming system is underwritten with government subsidies and loans. But now, even that's under threat as America moves to cut federal spending. So, at knockdown prices, they're selling their future. In the 1930s, tens of thousands left this land and set off west for California. The experience still haunts the landscape. The old route west, Route 66, has been replaced by Interstate 40. But 66 is still there, just at the side. In Steinbeck, the Jodes make this journey into a world of conflict, rootlessness, prejudice, and there's plenty of that today. What there is not today, and there was then, is general agreement about the direction of American economic policy, because then the state was set to play a larger part in crisis resolution, and now it's set to shrink. The journey through Texas and New Mexico takes you into a whole different landscape. Today, it's normal for Americans to move home to look for work. The rootlessness that shocked Steinbeck is almost a way of life. As a result, amid the desert, boom towns and boom suburbs that have now turned to bust. The families learned what rights must be observed. The right of privacy in the tent. The right to keep the past black, hidden in the heart. The right to talk and listen. That's how Steinbeck describes the camp for homeless migrants the Jode family turned up in. Joy Junction is a modern shelter for the homeless. Normally, the families who come here are coping with drink, drugs, domestic violence, but now there's a new kind of customer, the American middle class. I'm Larry Antista. This is my daughter, Michelle. Um, we're here because of the economic times. My uh, spouse took off on us, and that cut our income in half, and we lost our place, and here we are. They've been living like this for three months. He's a truck driver by trade, but he can't find work, so he works for his welfare payments, $300 a month. Michelle, aged 14, is still at school. Do the people at school know where you sleep every day? No, not really. You don't tell them? No. Why? They didn't ask, so they don't tell them. So you don't show up as homeless, even in the school statistics? No. The the sort of rich of America really, and the media, really understand that every night thousands of people are bedding down like this? No. No. And what would you say to them if you could speak to them right now? 
if they could live just like one day of like our lives, they'd see how hard it is and like how good they have it. Because a lot of them complain about what they got, which is really dumb. This man was, not long ago, the manager of a vehicle fleet. They lived in a motel, but his unemployment money ran out. You know, when those secure jobs, when you lose one and you have to downgrade, then you have to downgrade your lifestyle. And sometimes those bills, they start racking up and you only get further and further behind. And after that, it catches up a couple months and you start losing stuff. Yeah. Cars start getting took, can't pay your note, you end up here. Mom, can I ask you how it's, how it's been for you to cope with all this? Um, it's stressful. What's the, what's the toughest thing? I mean, you've been here how many nights now? I'm going on our second week. Second week. And what's the hardest thing about it? Well, um, just having my kids here. Yeah. Them. That would be my number one concern. The experience of Albuquerque gives me a whole new take on the motels that have been flashing past me on the freeway. Look closely, and many of them are housing the hidden homeless. What role does a place like this play in the whole housing and homelessness system? Huge. Uh, many of our, our folks for the first seven to ten days of each month on the first or thereabouts of each month, they get their government SSI welfare check. They spend some or all of that on getting a room for seven to 10 days. Then once the check runs out, they emigrate or migrate down to Joy Junction. So it's like an alternating system. It is. It's a reminder of the basic fact about this recession. It's a housing crisis. Many Americans can't afford to put a roof over their head and home repossessions are still rising. Eighty years ago, the single road west through Arizona was filled with migrants, farmers, workers, office workers, all displaced by poverty. This landscape of cactuses and vast canyons must have seemed to them like a different planet. If you compare the book to the actual journey, there's nothing in Steinbeck to prepare you for the vastness, the aridity and the distance that the 30s Dust Bowl migrants had to face. That's because I don't think Steinbeck ever made the full journey. What Steinbeck knew about was what lay at the end of the journey, which was social conflict. And today, you don't have to get to the end of the journey to find that. Arizona has become the political fault line of America, above all on the issue of migration. The boom times drew in millions of Hispanic migrants, millions of them illegal. But Arizona is still in recession and tensions are rising. At this jail in Phoenix, the inmates are forced to live in tents. The temperature on the day I went there was 114 degrees Fahrenheit. They're forbidden to cover their heads in the sun as well as pink towels, socks and sheets, they're required to wear pink underwear. The objective, humiliation. In this segregated section, every man is a migrant jailed under Arizona's anti-migrant laws and destined for deportation. Under a law called SB 1070, if you're stopped by the police and can't produce documents to prove your legal residence, you've committed an offence. Other laws criminalise the hiring of illegal migrants, transporting them. You don't have a name anymore. You become a number and they call you alien, as if you were from another planet. Fernando Lopez was picked up for driving without a license. He spent a month in the prison system and is now on bail fighting deportation. How do young Mexican men live? What kind of jobs do they do? Housekeeping, landscaping, restaurants. I don't like every restaurant you're going to find Mexicans in the back. What makes people come here? Since it is so inhospitable, these laws have been building up, why do people still come? It's really, really hard for them to live over there. So they don't have any other option than to go to other country. And I don't know, probably the best option is the United States. 
but the migrants keep on coming. In the car parks, at hardware stores, here and across America, men wait for casual work, for cash. As for the families, at this Hispanic community center, there is trepidation. Actually, we're living in a state with fear. We can't even go to the store. We can't even go out like we used to do it, like take the kids to the park, zoo, or take them somewhere to the mall. We can't even do that because now the kids are even fears that the police might stop their parents or might stop us. So. Right now, we just, stay, we just stay home and we don't do nothing. For, we just stay there. At the office of the man in charge of law enforcement, there's a daily protest. But fear is what he's aiming at. They're leaving. They don't want to go into the hot tents. Or they worry about the sheriff rounding them up in the workplace or coming into our county. That's why they're leaving. If you can do it in this county, you can do it across the United States if people have the will to do it and fight the politics or not care about the politics or the Hispanic vote or the employers hiring cheap labor. And to the argument that migrants do the jobs nobody else will, the sheriff, who speaks for many here, says this. That's the biggest insult to the greatest country in the world for politicians to say, nobody else will do these jobs. What are you kidding? Every time we go into a business and drag the people out working illegally, they get tons of people applying for the job that are U.S. citizens. We have an economic problem in this country where you have 10% unemployment. You have people from all professions that will wash cars to make money for their families. So you're trying to tell me that nobody will do these jobs? That's a cop-out. The last part of the Joad's journey would be the most arduous and tragic. They'd run into strikes, vigilante squads, roadblocks. In the 30s, people made this journey because at the end of it, there were jobs. But for the past year, America's been going through what economists call a jobless recovery. And right now, even the recovery itself looks like it's stalling. In the book, the Jodes cross the Mojave Desert by night, and at dawn, they come to the San Joaquin Valley. They drove through Tehachapi in the morning glow, and the sun came up behind them, and then suddenly they saw the great valley below them. In Steinbeck, the migrants come to California to look for work, and they find work. But the book is a metaphor for something else. It's about the search for a new economic model that can create jobs, sustain growth, and drive America out of recession. And that's a question they still face, even in a place like this. The Jodes journey ended in Bakersfield, Kern County. Today, the big employers here are oil and farming, but the biggest employer of all, by far, is the US government, in the form of the military. When America boomed, Bakersfield boomed. The population grew by a quarter in 10 years, but now 15% are unemployed and one home in 70 has been repossessed. All across the South, I found the same basic problem not enough jobs and not enough credit to revive the housing market. And in politics, there is plenty of wrath. <laughs>